All right. Thank you very much, Igor. It's my pleasure to join you today, and I'm very excited to return to some normalcy in physics. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy um, and enjoy the talk, and feel free to ask questions as we go along. So what I want to talk to you today is about fluid dynamics in the extreme. And to do that, I need to introduce the idea of the quark gluon plasma. Okay. So before we do that, though, let's go back to just physics 101. When I talk to my undergrad students, what are the properties of a fluid? The first thing we think about is it flows in some way, is that the particles can easily pass uh, past each other. And so we think of something like a river here. Or the next thing we could think about is that it takes the shape of a container. There's no permanent shape. It's easily moving around. Now, my favorite thing is this little video here. You can see what a water balloon looks like when you collide with a bowling ball. And that's, it looks like this because it cannot resist a shearing force. And so it's always sort of deformed. You drop a pebble in a lake or something along those lines. And then the last thing to think about when we have a fluid is we think about densities and pressures. We're not thinking about the mass and the forces. And so throughout my talk, whenever I talk about thermodynamics, I'm talking about density. Yep, some lost back. <laughs> So when can we actually apply fluid dynamics? That's, that's one of the first questions to ask. So generally when we think of fluid dynamics, we think of something like a giant lake. And so you need to have a large separation of scales. You'd have a small scale structure. This would be something like the individual um, H2O molecules and how long it takes before they bounce around and hit other ones versus the large scale structure, which is the entire size of the lake. And so you can take one of the small scale structures by the large scale and you would find something called the Knudsen number. And so the idea is this Knudsen number has to be quite small. And then we could think, okay, then we can apply fluid dynamics. And people use fluid dynamics everywhere. It's used on many different levels. You can think of like blood flowing through, through your body, traffic jams, they use fluid dynamics to describe the, the motion of cars going through light signals, as you can see right here. And then one recent example that's made a lot of news is neutron star mergers, when these two large uh, merge together and hit each other. So these are ways that you can use fluid dynamics. But as a physicist, I'm quite greedy. I want to think about what happens to fluids in the most extreme cases. Those to me are the ones that are really, really interesting. And so one question I like to think about is what happens when a fluid starts moving at the speed of light? And what we find is that you need to go back to the books and use different equations. You can't use Navier-Stokes, which is typically what people use for fluid dynamics that are not relativistic. But when we talk about fluids moving at the speed of light, we have to switch to Israel-Stewart equations. And this is in order to preserve causality and stability. Also, I like to think about what happens when a fluid is at the highest temperatures possible on Earth, 10 to the 12 Kelvin. And so you can see this little graph here. It's much, much hotter than a volcano or our sun. It's way, way up here in terms of temperatures. And when we reach these really, really high temperatures, then we have to think about new degrees of freedom. So we think about quarks and gluons instead of little H2O molecules when we're thinking about what's making up the fluid. And then the next thing that I like to think about is what is the smallest fluid? At what point can we just keep taking particles away and away? You have this very, very tiny fluid. When can we still apply hydrodynamics? And at that point, when you start thinking about Knudsen numbers, the separation of scales, it starts to get a bit tricky. Now, as I said, as a physicist, I'm quite greedy, and I want to actually think of all three of these things happening at the same time. In order to do that, I look at the quark gluon plasma. And so basically, you need the highest temperatures on Earth to create it. It's the smallest systems possible. So what we do is we collide two nuclei, and sometimes even maybe protons. There's maybe some signals of the quark gluon plasma, even in size of a proton. And then it also is moving at ultra-relativistic speeds, something like 99.99999% the speed of light. So we have a super hot, super tiny, super fast fluid. And this is kind of a picture example of what that would look like. You could have a nucleus here, a nucleus there, they collide, and in between you get this quark gluon plasma right here. Now, before I can really talk about it so much, I'll at least give you an overview of some of the most interesting things that have been happening in the news recently for the quark gluon plasma. 
I told you already, we've reached the hottest temperatures on Earth. We were in the Guinness Book of World Records for that. We also have the smallest fluid possible. You can see a reach of nature physics on the topic. It's additionally the most perfect fluid. I'll get into the details of what I mean by most perfect, but you can kind of think of this as almost no frictional force between the different layers of the fluid. We also have a really, really strange fluid. I'm not sure if it's the most strange fluid in the world, but it is something with about 10% of the particles that come out of here seem to be about strange particles. And then the last thing that's been really new and we're trying to understand it is it looks like it's the most vortical fluid too. So you can think of it like little tornadoes inside the fluid as well. So how do we deal with this crazy, crazy fluid? How do we even understand that? So what we have to do is we have to first understand the strongest force in nature. Otherwise, what we talk about is quantum chromodynamics. That's the fundamental theory of the strong force. And so we need to learn about that first a bit before we can get into the details of the core cone plasma and what it is and how we describe it. So just to kind of remind you, there are four fundamental forces that we know of in nature. The strong force, electromagnetic, weak, and gravity. I'm really going to be focusing on the strong force here. This is essentially what binds together a nucleus. It helps to keep those protons and neutrons stuck inside a nucleus. And it happens only in a very, very short range, but it's extremely strong. So to understand this a little better, we have to think about the scales of the universe. I told you that we're looking at stuff on very, very tiny scales, but sometimes it's hard to wrap our minds around how small these scales are. So it's nice to compare to things in astrophysics to see what's a comparable distance. So if we think of our human body around one meter tall. If we wanna compare that to the size of an atom, that's 10 to the minus 10 meters. Now, on the, con uh, on the other side, in astrophysical terms, that's about the distance between the Earth to the Sun. So just even getting to the size of an atom is a very large distance. Then if we want to compare to what I'm interested in, which is really understanding what happens to these little quarks and gluons that are inside a proton, you would have to look even inside the atom to the nucleus here. And the nucleus is around 10 to the 14, minus 14 meters. And then even inside one of these protons and neutrons here, if you were able to crack those open and peer inside of what a proton looks like, you'd have these little quarks and gluons here. And that's on the scale of 10 to the minus 19 meters. And the proton itself is around 10 to the minus 15 meters. So if we think of something that's comparable in astrophysical sense, you could think about the distance to our nearest star, which is 10 to the 16th meters. So somehow, from the Earth to the nearest star, we want to study these behaviors of these quarks and gluons and understand what it is, how they're interacting and their properties. Now to do this, we need to use really, really high energies and us high energy theorists do not like to deal with units. So what we do is we say H bar equals C equals one. It makes our lives much easier. And then our fundamental units that we use in terms of a link scale would be femtometers. You'll hear me talk about that today. That's around 10 to the minus 15 meters, so it's very, very tiny. I'll talk about temperatures in mega electrovolts, which is 11 billion Kelvin. And I'll talk about mass in terms of MeV, which is around 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. So it's very small, very light, but very, very hot. Now, how does this fit into the idea of the standard model? Well, what I'll mostly be focusing on are these different quarks inside the standard model. Specifically, there are six quarks, and there's the up and down quarks, which are the light quarks. That's what I'll be referring to any sort of light particles. And then there's the strange quark, which is another thing that I'll be discussing. It's slightly more massive. And then you get much, much heavier quarks, the charm in the bottom and the top, which is very short-lived. These ones I won't talk about so much today in my talk, but they have some interesting behavior in how they interact with the quark gluon plasma. And additionally, they're mediated all these interactions through this gluon here. So to understand the theory of the strong force, or quantum chromodynamics, you have essentially two underlining principles that, that one has to understand. Is first of all, you have bound states. So that means that your quarks and gluons are always stuck within some sort of hadron. So you can see here's the proton. It has three valence quarks. Um, and this would give you a, a baryon or a fermion, 
And you can also get anti-quarks, which would then give you an anti-proton. If you then all of a sudden have a strange quark in the mix of these three, I would call this a strange particle. Now, in terms of uh, other particles that you could have, you could also have a quark-anti-quark -quark pair. So you could have an up and anti-down. This would give you a pion. And if you have a strange quark in there for a meson, this would be something like a kaon. And you can even get much more exotic particles. For instance, a charm, anti-charm. This would give you a gypsi. But the idea here is that in everyday life is that they're always color neutral. Each of these quarks carries some sort of color charge with them. but ensuring that there are either three of them together or a quark anti-quark is it's color neutral and you don't see any quarks and gluons that are free running around in nature. Um, additionally, to understand this a little bit better is you have confinement. So the idea of no free quarks. So you might have seen these like little finger traps when you were a kid. Imagine you have a romeson and you could take it by hand and just pull those quarks as part as far as you can. The farther and farther you pull them apart, the harder and harder it is to do so. And so instead, if you could pull with like infinite amount of strength, what would happen instead of getting a free quark is you would actually have a quark anti-quark pair arise from the vacuum and give you two pions instead. So the idea here though with quantum chromodynamics is a very, very strongly interacting system. These quarks and gluons are constantly interacting and then essentially the, the interactions from gluons specifically are very, very complex. They can interact with themselves, they can interact with the quarks, and those interactions are really what's giving you visible matter that we see here today. So QCD, or, or, or visible matter, 95% of it comes from these quark, uh, sorry, these gluon interactions. And the one way we can kind of see this is see how much the mass of each of these um, are made up by what's given from the Higgs versus what's from the QCD mass. So if we look at the proton, for instance, has three valence quarks here. And if we just counted up the mass contributions from these three valence quarks, you would get something like 9.4 MeV. But if I go to a friend of mine that's an experimentalist and they measure the mass of the proton, they would say, oh no, no, it's not 9.4 MeV, but it's actually 938 MeV. So that difference in mass is coming from the interactions of the gluons, either with themselves or with the quarks. And so that means that about 95% of visible matter is from these gluon interactions. So how do we get into this? How do we study quarks and gluons? Because they're always stuck within inside some sort of hadron, inside of a proton or a met, um, meson or something like this. How do we get into those? Well, I like to go back and think about water. We can have different phase transitions of water, and depending on what phase we are, we learn different things. So, for instance, if you take water at atmospheric pressure and you just increase the heat added, and then this increases the temperature, you can see you go up here, increase, increase, and at some point, you're changing your degrees of freedom, you're adding heat, but you're at a constant temperature, and you go from a solid which is ice into a liquid, which is water. This is known as a first order phase transition when it's happening at a fixed temperature like this. And then you can continue to add more and more heat and you go up your, your phase diagram here. And at some point, again, you have another first order phase transition and you switch from a liquid into a gas. So we can kind of think about this with quarks and gluons is can we increase the temperature enough to look at deconfined quarks and gluons and understand more about their properties? So to do this, then we look at the phase diagram of QCD. Is essentially we have two things that we study here. We can look at, we can play with different temperatures. This is along the y-axis here, or we can think of the number of baryons to antibaryons in our system. So essentially, this is a chemical potential here. When we go out on this end, on the x-axis of the phase diagram, we have many, many more baryons in our system than antibaryons. And so if you think of this in condensed matter terms, this would be like we're doping our system with baryons and we get different phases of matter. And so what I'm talking about first is really the regime where baryons is roughly equal to the number of antibaryons. And so you can see here, this is probed by the Large Hadron Collider and this is what happened in our early universe. And I'll get into that more in a second. But what you can see from this Ferris diagram is we have this quark gluon plasma at really, really high temperatures. Below this, we have some sort of hadron resonance gas phase. These are where these protons and pions and kaons are all interacting with each other. And then we have here this crossover phase diagram. That means that basically your degrees of freedom are not switching at one fixed temperature. 
but it's happening at slower across a range of temperatures. And that's why you see a couple of lines here. And we believe if we go out to large enough baryon densities, at some point we'd hit a critical point and maybe have a first sort of phase transition line and things like neutron star mergers and neutron stars would be able to probe that better. So, but right now we wanna focus really on this regime where the number of baryons and antibaryons are equal. And so how do we understand that better? Well, one thing we could do if we could go back in time is just look at the early universe. Around 10 to the minus six seconds after the Big Bang, the whole universe was a quark gluon plasma. So how do we study that? Well, it's really, really hard, is we just don't have the cosmological tools to go back that far in time. If you think about the way we study the early universe, we have the cosmic microwave background effect, but that happened 10 to the uh, five years after the Big Bang, whereas the quark gluon plasma existed 10 to the minus six seconds after the Big Bang. So these are very, very different time scales. This unfortunately doesn't give us information about this quark gluon plasma phase in the early universe. So then we have to look into the lab. And this is where nuclear physics comes in and has been extremely successful. Essentially what we do is we create very, very tiny little bangs in the laboratory. And so we take like two atoms, like a gold atom, and we take all the electrons away. So we have these ions, just the nucleus of gold, and we accelerate them to basically almost the speed of light and they collide together. And when they do that, they reach extraordinarily high temperatures and they produce a very, very tiny little bang, is what we call, which produces the quark gluon plasma. So this is done locally in the US on Long Island using RIC and also at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And you can see one example of what happens when you collide these two ions together. This is an ATLAS event. You have two lead-lead collisions and they shoot out all of these particles and experimentals have to be very clever to work backwards in times and understand what happened with the quark gluon plasma due to these particle tracks. So to give you kind of an idea of what actually happens in these collision, breaking it down in terms of time scales, is initially you have these two nuclei, they're Lorentz contracted. So that means that they look like very, very flat pancakes. So these flat pancakes hit each other and they have some sort of impact region you can see right here. Now, if you're at extremely high energies, all the protons and neutrons don't get stuck there, but rather they kind of fly off to the detector. But what happens is you dump a large amount of energy, which is primarily gluons. This is what you see here. So what happens then is this energy dump turns into the quark gluon plasma, it expands and cools. At some point, it hadronizes. That means it starts producing particles like protons, neutrons, and pions. Those particles are still interacting, but at some point they freeze out and then they stop act interacting kinetically as well and they hit the particle detector. And this is what you can see here. These are the particle tracks that our experimentalist friends would actually measure. And so this is where all the information we get from experiments comes at these late time scales. And so they're really like archaeologists and they have to work backwards in times and think of really interesting observables so we can learn about the different stages of a heavy ion collision. So to give you some idea of the differences between a heavy ion collision and the Big Bang, um, here we have the quark epoch here and here we have the little bang, the heavy ion collision is you, all the thermodynamics should be the same. You should have the same pressure, entropy, energy density. You're comparing the phase transition between quarks and gluons and hadrons. The temperature should be pretty much the same. You're dealing with a strong force and you have a nearly perfect fluid. Now, the part where this, this analogy breaks down though is the system size is dramatically different. In the quark epoch of the Big Bang is, I heard that it's about maybe the size of a grain of rice. And while that might sound very, very tiny to you, in fact, we're dealing with system size in the order of 10 to the minus 14th meters. So we're talking about much, much smaller systems of the quark gluon plasma. And that means we have to start thinking about stuff like finite volume effects. Additionally, one of the big differences is we think that the early universe was probably equilibrated, but for us, we're definitely out of equilibrium without a shadow of a doubt. So we have to worry about viscosity and having a very large expansion rate. Additionally, the differences or with the early universe, we have one data point and we can't really even see it. Whereas with heavy ion collisions, we get billions of events. We have different types of initial conditions. We have different knobs and levers that we can look at and study it from many different angles. And so we can get a much fuller picture looking at heavy ion collisions and understanding what happened 
in this early universe. Now to do this, we're really lucky. We know the theory of quantum chromodynamics. One could just write down the Lagrangian. Um, the problem is it's really, really hard to solve. And so if we think about just stuff like in equilibrium behavior, this kind of gives us a map, a roadmap of what happens in the, the, the regime where you have baryons and, and antibaryons equal to each other and you go with temperature, what theories you can use. So if you go to really, really high temperatures, you can solve quantum chromodynamics perturbatively. Um, the question though is at what point this is applicable versus at what point do the, does the core, um, the core gluon plasma interacts so strongly that you can no longer do some sort of perturbative calculations. And so the part where I'm really interested in is around the phase transition. There we know that it's very, very strongly interacting. So you cannot do a perturbative expansion anymore. Rather, what we need to do is use lattice um, QCD in order to solve these calculations. I'll get to what that is and what that involves in a second. But these are very computationally expensive calculations, and we can only do these things for equilibrium properties. And then if we go to lower temperatures, we have to turn to other things, because at some point the error bars on lattice QCD get too large, and we have to look at other sort of theoretical descriptions. So one could use there like a hadron resonance gas or some sort of Boltzmann equation to describe the theory at very low temperatures. So what is lattice QCD? Well, essentially what we do is we put quarks on these lattice sites and the gluons are the interaction terms between us. And this is very strongly dependent with how much computational power we have. We need to calculate this essentially shrinking this into the continuum limit so you have as little spacing as possible there. And what you can find is if we look at Moore's law, which is shown down here, the more computational power we have, the more that we learn from lattice QCD. And so if you look back here, first we just had the pure glue equation of state. Eventually, um, in the early 2000s, we had enough computational power to look at the, and find out that we didn't have a first order phase transition, but rather a crossover phase transition in the early universe. Um, as we go up in time, we can see actually measuring the distance between the proton and neutron mass using lattice QCD, we can then get the equation of state of the early universe. And more recently, what I've been involved in is looking at the strangeness aspects of this, like finding missing strange particles or trying to understand the crossover regime better, comparing light particles to strange particles. So to give you an idea of what the, the equation of state of the early universe looks like, you can look at this picture here. This is our pressure. And like I said, high energy theorists, we don't like dealing with units. So we just normalize by t to the four. So everything is dimensionless. And you can see here, that we can visualize our phase transition. Along here is our temperature. We believe our phase transition happens around here, around 155 MeV in some sort of range. And so the way we study this is this purplish line here is lattice QCD calculations with their error bars. Up at very high temperatures, you can compare to perturbative QCD, but you have to take these error bars quite seriously here. So where you can actually assume some sort of weakly coupled regime um, that you can calculate perturbatively is, is up for question. If you go to very low temperatures, then like I said, is you can use a hadron resonance gas and it's extraordinarily successful there. You see this line here that matches quite well compared to the lattice QCD data. While it might be tempting to think it matches up to 200 MeV, once you'll start looking at other observables, it's clearer that this, this matching happens at a much lower temperature. But it is nice to visualize how you can compare things to lattice QCD and learn different information. And so here you would have hadrons, here you'd have your strongly interacting um, quark gluon plasma, and up here at some point you'd have something weakly coupled. So lattice QCD has been enormously successful in describing the thermodynamic properties of the quark gluon plasma, but the problem is, is that not everything is in equilibrium. I told you that from the get-go, is that we're dealing with something that's very much out of equilibrium. And so how do we handle that? Additionally, the other problem that we run into is not all the interesting physics just happens in the regime where the number of baryons to antibaryons are equal, but rather all this cool stuff in astrophysics is happening when there's many, many more baryons than antibaryons. So with lattice QCD, we can make it out a little bit into that regime. We can use the Taylor series. That's, you know, physicists love to do a Taylor series. But at some point, we just don't have all the information. And you can see in this plot here nicely that we get larger and larger error bars as we go out in baryon density. The other thing um, that we need to think about is how do we get this out of equilibrium behavior? We have transport coefficients. Uh, we need some sort of dynamical description of the quark gluon plasma in order to do direct comparisons 
to experimental data. And so we need to use some sort of effective models. Um, and the most tried and true one in the field is relativistic viscous hydrodynamics, followed by some sort of hadronic afterburner. And this has been enormously successful in the field. So the next part of my talk is going to be talking about the hydrodynamic aspects of this. So one thing that I like to think about, I mentioned to you before that we have a nearly perfect fluid. What does that actually mean? Well, you can see the comparisons here. Uh, on the left, we have a good fluid, it's water. You see it flows very nicely into this cup. On the right, we have a bad fluid. This is tar, it gets stuck, it doesn't flow. It looks very thick somehow. And so when I talk about a nearly perfect fluid, I'm thinking of the picture on the left. It's flowing very nicely. There's not much viscosity in there. Um, and so this is the idea of a nearly perfect fluid. So in order to define a perfect fluid, we have to actually think about something called transport coefficients and viscosities. So, so viscosities are one of the possible transport coefficients that we can have. And what is a transport coefficient? Well, essentially we take our fluid, we perturb it in some manner, move it away from equilibrium, and then we look at how quickly does it return to equilibrium. And so the different types of transport coefficients that are relevant to the quark moon plasma, first of all, you have bulk viscosity, which is a resistance of expansion or compression. Since this thing is expanding very, very rapidly, you can imagine this would play an important role. Additionally, you have shear viscosity. This is the viscosity of rubbing between different layers. This is also very, very vital to what we're understanding here. The next one is diffusion. This one is, is um, has been around forever, but it's something that's newer to our field because it only appears once you start going into the baryon dense regime. And so we can think about this as what happens when you drop ink into water is how quickly does it spread throughout the system. And so this is a nice plot here. You can see that we drop ink and it slowly sped, spreads throughout the system until it reaches some sort of equilibrium here at the end. And so this is the same thing as what happens when you put in more um, baryons into your system or strangeness or electric charge. How quickly does it spread throughout the core fluid plasma? And the last one, which I won't get into so much, but it's something that we need to understand a lot better, is vorticity. As I told you before, we also have these like little tiny tornadoes inside our core fluid plasma, and there's an associated transport coefficient with that as well. So Talking about shear viscosity, this is probably my favorite one, is that if you go back to Physics 101, what I tell my students is that we have these different layers and we're looking at how much friction is between these different layers. One could do some sort of kinetic theory description for a dilute gas and you would find, okay, I can write it down in terms of the average momentum, the, the mean free path, and the density. But what ends up happening here is if you can look at our estimates for the quark balloon plasma in terms of the shear viscosity, here you see that we call it the, the amount of fluid imperfection. So down here at the bottom of this plot near the string theory limit, we have a nearly perfect fluid. As you go up the plot, you would have something that's, that's closer to tar. And you see here that water is more than an order of magnitude more imperfect, which I already said was a, a pretty good fluid compared to the quark balloon plasma. In fact, the quark balloon plasma is really at this lower bound. I would say it's a fuzzy bound from string theory, but it's really at the lowest that we are aware of in terms of a nearly perfect fluid. The other remark that I'd like to make here is that you can see these dips in all of the little plots. And that is essentially when you have some sort of phase transition. So at the phase transition, we expect to have some sort of dip as you change your degrees of freedom. So what do we actually know about the quark gluon plasma? Well, when it comes to theory, it's really, really tough. Um, if you go to extremely high temperatures, you think you can apply PQCD, and so this could be on the order of one, although if you add some um, higher order corrections, then that might get down to like 0 0.5, but this is still much, much, much higher than any estimates we have comparing to experimental data. If you want to go into the low temperature regime, I can do some sort of calculation hadron resonance gas, and I can get kind of close to this if I add in enough particles um, to the string theory bound. And then we also think if we have this strongly coupled regime, maybe something like ADS-CFT is not a bad approach. And then you would expect something like 0 0.08 um, as an estimate for A over S. But I will caution that this is a fuzzy bound. So there, there's some, some error bar to this is the way you can think of this. But the ways we also probe this is looking at experiments. Is each experiment 
covers a different range in temperatures. So if you look at rake experiments, we can get up to here. If we go to LHC run one versus run two, we're probing a different range in our shear viscosity. And so this allows us to help map out what the shear viscosity looks like versus the temperature. Now, as a theorist, though, of course, I want to calculate in some sort of model. I can't calculate this directly from lattice QCD because I have the Fermi and sine problem, and it's just a no-go. But I can calculate this in some sort of theory. And so you can see here kind of what these theories are and what's going on in the field. Uh, on the left is the shear viscosity. On the right is the bulk viscosity. Generally, we expect, and you can see from all the theories, that we have some sort of minimum here as we change our phase, our, our, our degrees of freedom. And then for the bulk viscosity, we expect some sort of peak here on the right. But it's really hard to read this out. And a lot of different models will tell you different information about the order of magnitude of this. Since we don't have guidance for lattice QCD, it's something that's very difficult to constrain. So another approach to take to this in terms of figuring out our transport coefficient is saying, well, let's be completely agnostic. Let's take a Bayesian analysis. We put in some sort of functional form of shear and bulk and see what the data is telling us. And so you can see um, some recent results from the Duke group here, where we do indeed expect, when we do theory to experimental comparisons, a very small shear viscosity here. And we do expect a minimum of the bulk viscosity around the phase transition. If you're wondering why there's not a, an increase at the low shear viscosity, that's because they just didn't model it in this plot. So what happens though when I actually start, the whole point of this talk was to talk about relativistic hydrodynamics. So what does that look like? Well, let's imagine we have these two ions, they're colliding together, they look like little pancakes, and this is a snapshot of a hydrodynamic calculation right after they've collided. And so as they collide, they expand outwards in the longitudinal direction. That part's kind of boring, but if you see here, this is the transverse plane. There's a lot of interesting physics happening there. It's just, Expanding, it's cooling, and it has some interesting bumpy structure there. So oftentimes in the field, we only care about this transverse plane, so we can run 2D hydro um, in order to have a pretty reasonable description of the fluid. So I told you already at the very beginning of the talk that when we have fluids moving at the speed of light, we have to rethink everything. Uh, one of our biggest concerns is that we have that they're causal and stable. And if you take Navier Stokes equations, that are used for non-relativistic systems, this is just simply not true. Is they're unstable, they're acausal, um, and, and you just cannot use them. So what you need to do is use israel stewart equations. Basically what they do is they incorporate a relaxation time. So if you perturb your system here, there's some sort of finite time for it to return to equilibrium. And this time scale, this relaxation time is extremely important. And then it makes our equations causal and stable. So to give you a better idea of what these kind of look like, we have the israel stewart equations of motion. First of all, we have to conserve energy and momentum or we should just go home. Um, that's, you know, there's no other possibility around that. So you could, here's the conservation energy momentum. And this is if you have conserved charges. So in QCD, we have three area number strangeness and electric charge. And what do the equations of motion actually look like? Well, if you have your energy moment, uh, momentum tensor here, this is this T mu nu. This probably looks fairly familiar, but the biggest difference here is that when you have viscosity, you have this relaxation time. This is this tau pi here, and you have terms here that arise from this. So if you were to go to just um, Navier-Stokes, you'd only have this right-hand side of your term, but this left time is, it arises when you have a relativistic fluid. And you'd have the analogous situation for your bulk viscosity or whatever conserved charges you would have. And I should note that these, the number of terms here, I just had to truncate at some point, but there could be other terms as well in our system. Jackie, yes. there is a question here. Okay. Uh, Alexander, would you like to ask directly? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So on the slide, this is a few slides ago, sorry, yeah. um, but showing the viscosity of water and ultra cold atoms in QGP. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the minimum of these plots correspond to a phase transition. Is there yeah. an intuitive way to understand why the shear viscosity decreases in this vicinity? The shear yeah. Viscosity? yeah. So, I mean, what happens, I can tell you a little bit more what happens in the quark and plasma is essentially uh, you have, you always have to normalize it by something. So we look at the, the shear viscosity over entropy. And so I was a little bit sloppy with the way I said it, but actually what you see is the entropy increases dramatically. This is what actually hydro sees is this dimensionless ratio. 
And so as you go through the phase transition, you get an enormous increase in the entropy. So effectively what it's seeing for the shear viscosity is this minimum here. Um, and, and so it, it's basically another way to put this is when you have some sort of phase transition and you're going through it dynamically is you have inflection points that you would look into. So in the bulk viscosity, you have a peak. Uh, in the shear viscosity, you have a minimum. Uh, for other transport coefficients, you could have other sort of inflection points that see your degrees of freedom, freedom changing through the phase transition. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, moving back here. Um, so what does it look like for kind of the standard model of the quark home plasma? This is what I like to think of hydrodynamics in the nutshell, is we have some sort of initial conditions. I didn't talk about them so much, but to a first order approximation, we assume that we have a bunch of gluons interacting here. Um, and it's, it's complicated because you have quantum mechanical fluctuations, the, the positions of the protons and neutrons are, are moving around, but not only that, you have quarks and gluons that are also interacting. And essentially then we have at some point in time we're, we're allowed to apply hydrodynamics. There's, there's certainly questions about when that is in the field, um, but I'll leave that discussion for another time. But anyways, you apply then hydrodynamics and then it expands and cools your system. Now one important note though is hydrodynamics require a certain input. You need your viscosity and you need thermodynamic behaviors. So thermodynamics you get from the um, equation of state, which is something we take from lattice QCD. And so essentially your hydrodynamics is expanding and cooling and at some point you reach a temperature where hadrons can form. So that's basically cooling into hadrons. And then you have a gas of hadron that can still interact for a while, but at some point they reach a, a freeze out point where then we can learn information about what happened in the previous stages. So to see this more directly, um, let's just look in the transverse plane. Remember I said we had these two flat pancakes and they have some sort of collision point. This is known as impact region right here. So you have your two nuclei and whatever that impact region is where they're dumping a bunch of energy density could look something like this. It's not just a perfect almond, but there's a lot of little bumps and wiggles due to quantum mechanics that occur here. Now, it does have a dominant almond shape, which is why I have this round thing here. This is something called an eccentricity, and I define like epsilon two. You can also get other ones because it's a bumpy shape. You can get an epsilon three, which shows a triangular shape or square shape and so forth. But what happens is you have large, large, large pressure gradients that push outwards. And so fluid dynamics takes these pressure gradients, pushes your fluid outwards like this over time. And here you can see that you get this almond shape again in the final state. And so we measure this not in coordinate space, but rather in momentum space. And this is called a flow harmonic. And we find that this flow harmonic is very, very closely related to the initial condition that we had in our system. So how do we quantify this? Well, like I said, our experimentalists are quite clever. And so what they did is they took the distribution of particles and they write, write, wrote it in a Fourier series and we get these different coefficients and each of those gives us different information. So the second coefficient tells us about the elliptical flow, the third is triangular, square, and so forth. And the way they do these actual measurements is they're correlating multiple particles in your system to make sure that we are actually seeing signs of collective behavior. So what's a way to think about what these Fourier coefficients are telling us? We can think of, go back to the idea of the cosmic microwave background effect, is that they take different, this is the temperature fluctuations of the early universe, and they take a harmonic series of this as well, and you can see here, this is giving us lots of information about the Big Bang. There was actually a group that did an analogous uh, study using heavy ion collisions and, and basically took a single event and looked at this, this profile in the same sort of sense as a CMB. That's this top figure here. But essentially what we do is we take these Fourier coefficients, these are the black dots from some Elise data, and then we run our hydrodynamic codes playing with our transport coefficients. And we can see that if we had a lot of viscosity that we would have zero basically for our full harmonics. So this is why we know that our viscosity has to be quite small. And then we tune our viscosity until we get to the experimental data and we're able to reproduce that data. <clears throat> now, how, how well does this work? <coughs> it works surprisingly well is we can actually make quite precise predictions with hydrodynamics. 
if we change the amount of energy that these systems are colliding with, um, which is exactly what we did between run one and run two at the Large Hadron Collider, and then we made predictions. And we predicted the order of a few percentages that you would see an increase in the flow harmonics. And indeed, that was confirmed recently um, by the ELISE collaboration, as you can see in this plot here. So that's pretty exciting, is that um, even though this is extremely hot, extremely tiny scales, all the extremes, we can still make really nice theoretical predictions and have them confirmed by experimental data. It, it just blows my mind that this works. And not only that, but the shape of the different nuclei matter. Um, so in general, we use something like a lead nucleus, which is spherical, it's a double magic number. But then more recently, we've been thinking about, let's try something new. So there was a uranium nucleus, for instance, here that's been studied that looks like a football. And a very recent one has been xenon-129, which originally we thought was spherical. Um, but after doing some digging, we realized, no, this, this is slightly football shape as well. And we were actually able to see this in experimental data. So this was a collaboration I had with the Sacle group here. But what we found is when we compared lead, which is spherical, to xenon, which is uh, much more elliptical, that we can indeed see a difference in the data. This is this plot on the right, these experimental data points here. And our theory calculation for a spherical nucleus fails, whereas if we look at an elliptical nucleus that has this deformation, it brings us much closer to the experimental data. So it's really interesting that we can even see very small deformation in the nucleus. Now, the other thing that's been really interesting as of late is looking at the limits of what is the smallest fluid. I told you about Knudsen numbers at the very beginning is that this, there's this idea with fluid dynamics that you have, have a large separation of scales and your small scale should be much smaller than your large scale. But what happens when they start approaching the order of one? Um, so we can think of this as like fish here. We have a big school of fish. I think we could probably describe that with fluid dynamics. It'd work really well. But what happens if we keep removing fish? and we have some sort of system like this that's spinning around, is that still fluid dynamics? At what point can we no longer call it a fluid? <clears throat> um, and the surprising thing here is that experimental data um, is very well predicted once again by hydrodynamics. Now, certainly there's a number of questions here. This is very much a hot topic in the field um, with many unanswered questions. It's, it's something that us theorists get quite excited about, but I will say that initially hydrodynamics seems to be working quite well. Now, there are new questions that keep popping up. Is when hy is hydro applicable? Why is it applicable? Um, are there things that we're missing, for instance? But one thing that also is coming out of it is that these initial conditions is not just the large scale structure, the shape of the nucleus that's mattering so much, or even the, the, the position of the proton and neutrons, but rather these like little bumps and wiggles from quarks and gluons seem to be making a difference <clears throat> in these initial conditions. So this is something we're still trying to understand much better. So what are the next frontiers of relativistic hydrodynamics? There's so much that I can't even like scrape the surface in this talk, but I will say some of the cool things that are happening right now, um, there's magnetohydrodynamics. I know in astrophysics, this has been happening for years, but it's been really interesting in our field because there's the possibility of this chiral magnetic effect. And for that one would mean magnetohydro. The part that I've been quite involved in is this idea of looking at conserved charges of QCD. So basically, going back to the phase diagram, I want to go out into this very baryon dense regime um, and look at the interplay between baryon number, strangeness, and electric charge. And the cool thing about QCD specifically is that each quark carries multiple charges. And so this changes a lot of properties. It makes it very complex and very interesting for me. Uh, another thing that I find quite intriguing is there's this idea of jets that would move through a system. So it's probing basically the quark moon on a very, very short scale. And one has to actually include source terms in hydrodynamics to inc incorporate jets into, into this picture. And the last thing that, that's been really quite interesting is how do you incorporate critical fluctuations? I mentioned the possibility of a critical point. I'll get to that in a second. But how do you describe this in a relative vis viscous fluid? This is really not trivial. So kind of the, one of the big frontiers for the future is we're searching for this QCD critical point. So what is a critical point? If you look here at the phase diagram of water at atmospheric pressure here, you see this red line. I told you already there's a first order phase transition here and here. But what happens when all of a sudden we put a lot of pressure on it and put really, really high temperatures? At some point, you reach this critical point, and water does some really bizarre things. In fact, one thing you get is opalescence, where light gets stuck inside the water, and your water becomes white, changes color because the light 
gets stuck inside of it. And beyond that regime, you get what I call a crossover phase transition, which is up here at the extremes of water. And you can't really tell if it's a gas or water. Um, and so you have like this smooth transition oops, between the two. And so the analog for us is then looking at this really baryon dense regime and trying to search for this critical point, which is ongoing right now at the Rick Beam Energy Scan 2. So to do this, we need a lot of theoretical support. Um, basically, I'm involved in the BEST collaboration, the Beam Energy Scan Theory collaboration. And one of our first things to do was figure out the equation of state. And this was really difficult. Um, essentially, we take the best we know from lattice QCD, and then we incorporate a parameterized critical point. So essentially, we can move around the critical point and do systematic searches for the QCD critical point, because we're not sure of the location or if it even exists. Um, and so to do this, there's been uh, two members, uh, Paulo and Debra, who have worked hard on, on creating this code that was recently uh, published just this year. But now kind of the next stage of this is twofold. First of all, um, this code was done just in terms of baryon density. The next thing that one has to think about is adding in strangeness and electric charge. Uh, Jamie has been working very hard on doing that. And then on top of this, we know everything is out of equilibrium. So we need to start actually thinking about a new axis of the phase diagram of how do out of equilibrium behavior affect the search for the QCD critical point. So this is a really non-trivial question and many, many theorists are, are kind of banging our heads against the wall trying to understand this problem. So my group has been quite active in this. Um, some of the recent work that we've been trying to do is really understand what happens to the initial condition. So I told you originally that the initial condition is essentially a bunch of gluons that are dumped there. But when you go to lower and lower beam energies, this is what this beam energy scan is doing, or going out in the phase diagram, you have all of a sudden um, variants that get stuck in your initial condition. This is really hard to describe from a theoretical perspective. So we're trying to do an initial study of this. Basically, um, instead of getting baryons stuck in our system, we're just allowing our system not just be uh, gluons, but influence of the quarks as well. And so my postdoc, Matt Sievert, has been um, very active in this, along with our collaborators, Mauricio and Doug. And so for the first time, we've put in quarks and their influence into these initial conditions and are able to look at conserved charges, like baryon number, strangeness, and electric charge. And the really cool thing that we're finding here is that strangeness is very different than light particles. Um, they, they have a very different initial profile. There's less of them and they're doing some cool things that we're, we're trying to study. And this also makes some connections to the future electron ion collider uh, where we can think about the distribution, the parton distribution functions. The other thing that one has to think about in the search for the QCD critical point is looking at these baryon diffusion parameters. So as I told you before, we have this new transport coefficient once we go out into the large baryon density regime. And this is like we're dropping ink into water, except for in this case, we're not dropping ink, we're dropping quarks. And the quarks have three different charges, baryon number, strange electric charge, and we wanna see how they diffuse through our system. And so if you see this nice plot on the, the right, you can see the black curve is when we have no diffusion, so this is very similar to the initial condition where the baryons have this double hump structure. But once you allow for more diffusion, it allows these baryons to move around through your system, and all of a sudden they move towards mid-rapidity here. So they're moving towards the center um, of the system. So there's some really cool prospects there that we're just starting to get into in the theoretical community. The other thing that we're trying to understand, and this is with my PhD student, Travis, and my former REU student, Emma, is looking at the influence of very far from equilibrium behavior and the search from the critical point. Uh, so what you're seeing here is essentially a phase diagram. This is temperature, this is bearing chemical potential, and this is how a hydrodynamic simulation would pass through the QCD phase diagram, is you have some sort of initial condition up here that's circled, and basically then as it expands and cools, you go through your QCD phase diagram. And at some point you reach this green dot, which is where you hit freeze out and you can actually measure yields from experiments. Now, why we care about this is we find that the initial conditions matter enormously. For instance, if something is very far from equilibrium, you have very, very different initial conditions that will lead you to this green dot below. And so we're trying to understand how this influence of the initial conditions affect the search for the QCD critical point.
Now for the future, we have a number of experiments that are going on that will study this in much, much more detail. Um, first off, we have the electron ion collider, which is something I'm extremely excited about. It'll give us much more information about the nucleon nuclei structure. This is really important for our initial state. Um, and an initial state plays a very key role in our heavy ion collisions. So it's fantastic that we'll be having this in the years to come. One of the next projects too, after this beam energy scan, is we're looking at S Phoenix and also future LHC upgrades where we're studying jets. And they tell us about much, much more small scale structures of the quark balloon plasma. So this is very nice complementary uh, information to what I showed in this talk already. And then the other thing that's ongoing right now, and hopefully we'll have results in the next few years, is this beam energy scan um, at RIC. But this is also complemented by FAIR that's getting um, built at GSI, and there's also NECA as well. And so this will tell us much, much more about the QCD phase diagram, even getting into the astrophysical territories in terms of baryon densities. And so just to kind of show how that maps out in terms of the QCD phase diagram is we have our LHC up here. This is the early universe. There's the possibility of a, a future collider in China. Then we have RIC, the beam energy scan. We have FAIR and NECA here that gets us out to the baryon dense regimes. And there's also some very nice results from LIGO now that are beginning to come out that will help to be complementary to where we're probing this QCD phase diagram and from NICER as well. So that kind of summarizes my talk. I hope I convinced you that the relativistic viscous hydrodynamics is a very successful description of the quark balloon plasma. We have way more things to do than we have time and, and people. Um, so we're always interested in, in collaborations or thinking um, about more possibilities to study with this. It's very much in the discovery physics regime. So there's just many things to learn. Um, there's much to come in the future in terms of conserved charges, critical fluctuations, magnetohydro, jets, coupled to hydrodynamics, so many things to do. And also on the experimental end, we just have an enormous amount of experiments ongoing that'll help us to understand both quantum chromodynamics and the quark balloon plasma. So thank you very much for having me and let me know if you have any questions. Wow, that was a fabulous talk. Uh, very well organized, very nice. Uh, audience, please ask your questions if you have some. Uh, let me know in the chat message, you raise the hand. Uh, in the meantime, while we are waiting, I do have a short question mm -hmm. uh, regarding the, I believe you called it strange crossover. Yes. Can you truly separate a crossover associated with strange particles or heavy particles in general mm -hmm. uh, from the light crossover? What's the quantitative uh, formal way of doing it? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question, Igor. Um, so I didn't get into this in the talk, but one thing that we look into are the, on the event by event basis, like I said, we have billions of data points, how much uh, the conserved charges fluctuate. And so what we would look at in order to look at this like light versus strange crossover is the distribution of like net protons and a net um, electric charge. So that would be like protons, pions, and kaons versus strange particles. So this would be like the distribution of net kaons or net lambdas. And so from there, we can do direct theoretical calculations um, for instance, using a hadron resonance gas or using lattice QCD even. Um, and when we compare these numbers, we can extract a, a temperature and bearing chemical potential. And what we find is right now, when we look at these fluctuations, there's always this splitting between the light and the strange particles. Um, and so the, for our best estimates, uh, it's about a 10 to 20 MeV difference in the temperatures that we're getting there. I see. I see. My concern about that crossover was associated with the fact that perhaps they are too heavy to be in equilibrium with the rest of the stuff. And mm -hmm. in that case, maybe it's not the indication of any crossovers, but simply decoupling. Right, right. No, this is a, I mean, it's, it's very much an unanswered question right now. So um, I would say that we can do shockingly well with these fluctuations, both comparing between a lattice QCD and a hadron resonance gas, uh, which you know, I work on this and it's something that I still find surprising. Um, in terms of like some sort of dynamical description, this is something that, that actually my group is kind of talking about doing, but we haven't gotten into yet um, to see if you, one can understand this for if it's out of equilibrium, right? Um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, this is certainly something that you and I have thought about back in the day quite a bit. And we're, we're thinking about revising some of these ideas as well. Um, but it's, I, I would say it's right now an, an unanswered question. Well, fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to steal the show. Any questions yeah. from the rest of the audience? Uh, Pavel, please. Um, <clears throat> hi, Jacqueline. Um, hi. <clears throat> my question is about vorticity. So you mentioned QGP being the most vortical fluid. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate both from experimental and theoretical perspectives. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, um, this is not something that I'm so much an expert on, but I will say that the way they're doing these measurements is looking essentially at lambda polarization. Uh, and so there was a recent, I think it was either Nature or Nature Physics paper on this, where from the lambda polarization, they could extract essentially the vorticity of the fluid. Um, in terms of the theoretical description, uh, there's been a number of groups working on this. It's, it's not that easy. Um, I know from a hydrodynamic perspective that you could actually put in a, a vorticity contribution. Um, and so there has been work from like Gabriel Danico on this. Um, also a number of the Polish groups have worked on this quite a bit. Um, and, and there are certainly some complications there in the theoretical description. Sometimes like comparing theory to experiment, the signs are different. Um, there's also, I believe, one of the hydrodynamic terms that you'd want to put into the description can actually break down hydro in terms of making it a causal. Um, I'm not, like I said, the expert on this, but this is just what I've heard from in the community. So there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions there. I think it's still in the very initial stages of what we're kind of grasping in terms of understanding this. Thanks. Great. Any other questions? Uh, yes, please. Damson, please. If you can unmute yourself, please ask directly. Hi. Hi. So uh, my question is regarding you at the second point in your summary. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned a couple of topics. Which one you think in, opi in your opinion that the community should focus on first? Ah, okay. Um, if, I thought somehow it was that. Okay, uh, I think there's a few people talking. Um, but yeah, so that's a really good question. I would say that in my mind, it kind of goes with what are the current experiments because we want to be uh, up to date on the theory so that we can do more direct comparisons and also theory can guide the experiments in terms of future observables. So I kind of think of it from that perspective. Um, in that case, there's, there's essentially like two that really stand out. Um, right now we have the isobar run, which is looking for the chiromagnetic effect. So certainly stuff on the magnetohydro is, is desperately needed. Um, how that couples to like viscosity and stuff, there's a lot of non-trivial questions there. That, so that's kind of like a need for the immediate future. Depending on what comes out of the isobar run, that would certainly influence my answer quite a bit. Uh, and then the kind of next thing is this beam energy scan too. Um, and so that's the search that that's basically both conserved charges and critical fluctuations. Uh, and so a lot of groups are kind of working on those two things independently with the idea that eventually they'll kind of merge together. Um, so this is something that will be needed over the next few years. Um, and then the jets coupled to hydro, uh, hydro, this is something that's needed for S Phoenix, which is after that. So that's kind of like the, the third priority um, is to get jets coupled to hydro and that would be kind of the longer term perspective. Okay. okay. Uh, hi, Jackie. Hi. Uh, yeah. Um, you, what is the smallest system that we have hydrodynamically? Yeah, that that's um, <laughs> that is certainly up for debate. I will say that uh, I'll answer it like this: it is the smallest system where we have signals of a possible quark gluon plasma. What I mean by signals, I mean a, a finite flow harmonic, so like a, a V two. That's that's large and positive. Um, that would be a proton-proton collision. Now, there are certainly unanswered questions on the applicability of hydrodynamics there. Like if, if I had to answer it, what I think is really hydrodynamics, I think something like a, a proton lead collision has a really good chance of being hydrodynamics. I'm not so convinced right now for proton-proton. There could be other reasons that we're getting those signals. Um, and we've actually gone back, okay, not me, but um, the group at MIT went back and looked at E plus E collisions 
um, and revisited old data and they found no signal whatsoever of flow harmonics there. So, so it was a little comforting that at some point it looks like if you get to a small enough system size that you don't see signs of hydro. Um, but there's definitely a lot of murky territory between protons and proton lead collisions. And now we're thinking of doing like smaller intermediate systems like argon and oxygen. Um, and the exact cutoff is, is kind of murky at this point. Thank you. Other questions? Please ask other questions. Yes, please. Malena, please go ahead. Hi, Jackie. Can you hear Hi. me? Hi. Yes. Hi. So, as, as far as I understand, there's limitations from Lattice to access the finite uh, chemical potential mm -hmm. side of the phase diagram. Yes. And so, I wonder from your perspective, how helpful do you think it will it, it could be now to go back to the theoretical tools that we have uh, from the perturbative regime and try to extend them to work on this um, side of things mm -hmm. rather so what I mean concretely is that at the beginning of your talk you showed that the perturbation theory has obvious limitations on, on the treatment of, of um, mm -hmm. sort of mean, middle temperature, high density regime. Right. How helpful do you think people like us could, should or could, uh, should f focus on, on, on furthering perturbative mm -hmm. te techniques to help right. on, on this side of things? Right. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, certainly if one could get the error bars down on the PQCD calculations further, that would help so we know when it's applicable versus when it's not. That, that certainly would be useful. Um, another thing that of course is, is very useful in the modern day is understanding, I know you can do perturbative calculations in a very large, very dense regime as well, um, and understand more, you know, revisiting a lot of the old ideas with neutron stars, neutron star mergers, I think is also quite useful. Um, I, I also think it's just, it's such a big, enormous problem in the field that any, any attempts at it are extremely important. Because um, there's always somewhat of a concern that it's such a big problem that we ignore it and we don't want to do that. Um, I know that there's been a lot of other really cool ideas going around. Uh, one has been like, you know, once we get some sort of quantum computer, there's been people thinking about how to get into the very dense regime with that. But I think those, those estimates are like 40 years down the road. Uh, another thing that I've been active with is looking at other sort of models like um, a non-conformal ADS model. And so essentially there is that you can teach black holes to look like lattice QCD and do predictions even. Um, and so what we did is we actually, you get a critical point from this model and you can make predictions and they were later confirmed by following lattice QCD, lattice QCD results. Um, so I think Basically, my, my thought on it is any, any approach to it helps, <laughs> is we really need more physics there because there's so many uncertainties. And one thing I didn't quite discuss is that um, hydrodynamics covers, in terms of the phase diagram, I kind of showed this nice pretty picture of what Travis had done with this trajectory through the phase diagram. But the reality is, is we cover huge swaths of the phase diagram in, an, in just one single hydrodynamic event. Is it's not just a fixed T and UB, but it's a huge range in the equation of state. Actually, and, that my question, uh, that's why I was asking because of yeah. this beautiful, like these trajectories that you show that start mm -hmm. really wide. Yes. And then they come into the yield point. Right. Uh, so I think there, maybe we could help uh, at, the, at the top of this uh, plot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I'll go back and show this from uh, Travis and Emma's work is essentially, yeah, we have this huge range that we're reaching. And, and this is kind of the average value, but if you actually look locally, this was also the work done um, a couple of slides back by, by Matt, Mauricio and Doug and myself, is that you get a wide range. These are densities down here. Um, and so these are the initial conditions and your initial conditions probe this huge range in the phase diagram, even at LHC energies. And so we like to think that LHC energies is just the same number of variance antivariance, but the reality is we're actually probing a wide range of the, the phase diagram. It's just they kind of converge to the, the zero bearing chemical potential axis over time. 
Very yeah. nice. Very nice. Actually, that it was a very, very legitimate question. In a way, that's why we have this colloquium to create some thoughts, to right. give you some additional ideas and maybe stimulate some new developments. Any other questions from the audience, please ask. We are going to wrap up it soon, but if you still have something, please do ask. Um, in the meantime, I'm just waiting, uh, seeing if anybody will have something else. Um, you, I couldn't help noticing, you mentioned several times the word fuzzy about the boundary for the yeah. lowest possible ratio. And I was kind of, intrigued by that because some people might insist it's very very strict mm -hmm. even though you are emphasizing this so i guess you have a very good reason for that right yes yeah i do have a good reason for that i happen to be uh married to one of the people who've been working on that um but yeah it's it's basically there's a there's a lot of ways you can break that boundary uh, one of the simplest things is that you can add higher um Basically, you have to take uh, certain derivatives when you're calculating your eight over s, and if you, and normally it's only up to the second order, but if you allow for higher order derivatives up to fourth order, you can start breaking um, uh, certain things with ADS, where you see that you can actually get like a temperature dependence of eight over s in in your string theory approach. Um, if you have magnetic fields, this would also break this. You don't get exactly this this one over four pi bound. Um, I know there are other things as well. Um, I'm not necessarily the person who's the most up to date in all these details, but you certainly have ways that you can violate this. Um, and so once you put into something, you know, like, like the way we can kind of think of this is ADS is in the, the, the extremely strongly coupled regime, but once you put in like higher order corrections to make it like slightly less strongly coupled, you can start getting some sort of temperature dependence for your A over S and it's not just a strict bound anymore. Right, right. No, it's it's fair statement. What I meant by strict, I meant that in principle, it, there are arguments based on the uncertainty principle. And oh, yes. in fact, there should be a lower mm -hmm. limit, no matter what right. the numerical coefficient is. Right, right. And yeah, no, I believe I, uh, yeah. Andre Starinets would want to comment about that. Just a sec, Andre, just uh, let Jackie finish and you go after that. Yeah, I was just gonna just yeah, I agree with you, Igor, is that we would expect from the certain principle at some point, you do have a lower bound. It's just where that is, uh, is not so clear to me. And maybe others who are more experts can say something. Andre, you want to add something? Uh, yes, just, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, the specific, each specific calculation in string theory and holography is precise. So it, it, there is no fuzziness in that sense, but um, indeed the, um, the calculations at finite coupling. So once you calculate at infinite coupling, it gives you this one over four pi result. And uh, uh, if you start calculating at finite coupling, uh, large but finite coupling, then depending on a specific model, you can get uh, model dependent results. And in some of them you can get uh, in some models, you can get uh, you can get uh, uh, results which are less than one over four pi. But then there are questions of how these models actually uh, behave in other uh, respect, and some of them uh, show various uh, instabilities in superluminal uh, uh, propagation of signal and so on. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, although each calculation is precise, uh, to say something at finite coupling which is sufficiently universal would be rather premature from holography perspective. Thank you. Okay. I guess that that is very valuable from one of the uh, eponymous people, eponymous term, uh, KSS limit. So very nice. Other people, anybody else wants to ask anything? We're about to finish this session. As I said, it will be uh, posted somewhere, you will be able to see. Uh, please, Georgia. I don't think we can hear you. Are you trying to talk? Uh, can, you hear, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just as a comment, since you were, you guys started talking about this uncertainty principle issue. Um, I think that 
any universal, any universal limit to it over S, and this is really important for small systems, would have to come from something like a bottom-up approach. The, in the sense that the microscopic theory can be whatever, but if it has a hydrodynamic limit, eventually it should become inconsistent because um, the equation of state comes from statistical mechanics, but the same partition function also controls fluctuations, which even outside of a critical point for a small system become non-negligible. That should give you a viscosity. I mean, in fact, ADS CFT might not be the best place to look for it because of the um, because of NC going to infinity, and that makes fluctuations just from statistical reasons go go to zero. Vorticity, which was mentioned, also potentially via vorticity polarization coupling could also act as a viscosity as well. So it might be that bottom-up approaches might be better. Just as a comment. Thank you. Although, frankly, I'm not sure I personally understood what means bottom up, but uh, hydrodynamics with fluctuations. Hydrodynamics with fluctuations. <laughs> I see. I see. So, uh, one thing I will add, I guess, to, to Giorgio's comment um, is. Yeah, so from what I understand is you're saying basically extracting it from like theory to experimental comparisons using fluctuations within hydrodynamics. Uh, and one other thing though too is I know some groups have been working on like effective shear viscosities as you as you shrink your system size, right? So basically as you, you change your Knudsen number um, because you're going to smaller and smaller systems is one would affect, one would expect some sort of effective viscosity as well. So this is, this is I know there, there's a number of groups thinking about this too. Okay, um, anybody else? Well, if I don't see anybody else asking any questions within the next half a minute, a minute, we will be wrapping this up. I would like to use the opportunity to thank Jackie for this very nice uh, presentation, for taking time from busy life of preparing online lectures and watching kids and doing everything in this unrealistic world that we live in right now. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Using the opportunity also, I would like to advertise, we will be running this probably for the next few weeks, every Wednesday at the same time. I do have a, a lineup of people for the next few slots. They're not fully confirmed, but nearly confirmed. As soon as I get that information, I will be posting it, sending it, distributing it. Perhaps I will create a website where all of that information will be posted. So thanks everybody and have a good day. Stay healthy and good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.